missions as a supporting one. Now, we do that. We, we support missionaries that go places that we cannot go, but our first responsibility towards missions has to do as a personal responsibility. What are you doing to reach your mission field? Your place, your people. As we begin to have that discussion, the first thing, perhaps one of the most important things, and tragically one of the things we most quickly overlook, is this matter of prayer. A wise old preacher once said that all of our failures are prayer failures. And while we can do anything after we have prayed, we can do nothing until we have prayed. When we go back and we look at some of the great revivals of history, I think of in the United States, a revival that maybe doesn't get nearly as much attention as it should, the Sandy Creek revival that spurred the planting of Baptist churches, many of which are, have continued on till today. When we think about the great Welsh revival that swept that part of the world, we could look at, at countless others, but the thing that remains the same is every single one of these instances began with somebody praying. And yet, if we were to look at our churches today, the spiritual discipline that perhaps receives the smallest amount of attention is our prayer. It's, it's really quite baffling to think that tonight we have the privilege, the, the opportunity to stand before our Creator and ask what we would. And we are content to ask so very little. When we get to heaven one day, and I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to going home, amen? But one day when we stand before God, I think one of the great tragedies that we will come to understand was all that could have been done, but wasn't because we didn't ask. As we come to the book of Nehemiah this evening, I, I love this, this history because Nehemiah was just a man. <laughs> he was just a guy, just a regular average old Joe. And God stirred in his heart a desire to do a work. And he didn't just ask God for big things. He didn't just ask God for great things. He asked for impossible things. And not only did God give him what he asked for, but God provided what was necessary for Nehemiah to do a work that would come to shape not only the rest of Jewish history, but would impact humanity. And it began with a request. Nehemiah in chapter number 2 this evening, if you found your place in the Word of God, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king, now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. 
And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. If you're in the habit of marking your Bibles, there is a phrase that is given to us in verse number 4, and it is the title for our message this evening, and it is this, For what dost thou make request? Nehemiah stood before the king, arguably at this time, the king of most of the known world. But do you know that this evening that you sit in the presence before the king of kings? Can I ask you a deeply provoking question? If you could ask him anything. For what dost thou make request? You know, Brother Steve, I hear all the time, Brother Gall, we're praying for you. Man, that's a blessing. But one of my, my curious thoughts, maybe an intrusive thought, is for what do you pray for? Tonight, as we look at you reaching your mission field, I'm going to challenge you, like Nehemiah, to ask for three very specific things. And when I'm done, God helping me, I'm going to challenge everyone under the sound of my voice to make a decision. You say, Brother Gall, I don't want to make a decision. You have made yours. And you made the wrong one. So with all of this in mind, Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing upon this time, and then we will dive right into it. Jesus, I love you, and I'm so very grateful that you love me. And I'm thankful to be here and, and to speak to these faithful folks. Lord, I pray for boldness and clarity in my thoughts and in my words. I pray for conciseness. God, I pray that you give me liberty to say all that you desire to be said and the strength to refrain from saying anything that need not be said. And I just ask for your blessing. Bless the reading of your word and bless the preaching of it. Be with preacher as he travels to Tennessee. Keep him and his family safe. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Nehemiah in chapter number one has just received news of his home. And it's a sad tale. The wall is in ruin. The gates of Jerusalem that stood for so long as a bastion of security and safety are now in ash and fire. A city that was once heralded as the jewel, the gem, the, the city of God's people is now nothing more than a testament to God's judgment upon his own people. The word used in Nehemiah chapter 1 is the word reproach. We don't use that word very often in our, our English vernacular today but it is the word from which often we would use the word embarrassment. It's not just bad, Nehemiah. It's so bad, it's embarrassing. I can't think, help but think about my own country. A place that once stood as the bastion of Christianity. As Americans, we were proud to declare that we were a Christian nation. Can I help you with something this evening? America is not a Christian nation anymore. I was thinking the other day, Pastor Steve, there was a young man I went to college with. He was from South Korea. I have given up trying to pronounce his name. We're going to call him Bob. And Bob, Bob was, he was, he was I, I shouldn't say this because I'm an odd duck, but Bob was an odd duck. And you know, birds of a feather. Right, and uh, Bob had came, and he he was he was just he was full of energy. Those are the kinds of people I like to be around. And uh, he was a missions major, and so we just all assumed he was going back to Korea. And I sat down with Bob one day and I said, "Bob, tell me when you finish school, when you're done, and you and your wife he he was already married. He came to college a little bit later than the most of us. So where are you going? Tell me about." your ministry overseas. He said, Brother Gall, you don't understand. I'm not going back to Korea. I said, where are you going? He said, to Detroit, Michigan. Folks, countries are sending missionaries to us. I want you to think about that. As I think about the, the spiritual fortress that America once was, we could draw the metaphor this evening that much like the historical nation of, of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, our gates are broken down. 
Our walls are in ruin. We have become a reproach. And if God's people are to see God move, it does not begin with some form of mysticism or or some kind of mystical moving of some transparent force. It will begin with God's people returning to Him. And that can start no other place but in prayer. Nehemiah goes before the king. The Bible says that the king notices his countenance. Can I ask you, when was the last time that you saw the spiritual state of your nation and it brought you to tears? I'm not talking about being a keyboard warrior on Facebook for your political platform or for who you voted for. I'm talking about the last time that you drove through your city, through your street, saw your people, and it brought you to tears because they're lost and they're going to hell. Nehemiah says to the king, king, live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? Why should not I be bothered? My home is in waste and ruin. And it is in this moment, beyond defying all reason, that a pagan king of all people says, what would you ask of me? It it really is an impossible scenario. Understand, this king is responsible for the enslavement of his people. He's part of the reason that Jerusalem is in ruin to begin with. What would you ask of me, Nehemiah? And I love this, this ain't my notes, but we're going to chase a rabbit for just a moment. If you look in, in verse Verse number 4, the Bible says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. We can be really quick to just jump over that. I love the picture there. Nehemiah is in the court of the king. The king's there, the queen's there. There's probably a bunch of guys that are court advisors, viziers. And the king asks him a question, and before Nehemiah says anything, he stops, bows his head, and prays. I wonder what that must have been like. Nehemiah, you hear me? Nehemiah's just praying. Why? Because it was more important that God heard him than that man heard him. We can always speak to man on behalf of God after we have spoken to God on the behalf of men. Then Nehemiah, he finishes praying and he opens his mouth. And he asks the king for three things. Now tonight, these three three things will form the prayer I am challenging you to pray for your own life. Now I'm going to warn you, if you pray these things, God might just answer your prayer. Sometimes we're more afraid that God will say yes than that he will say no. Let's jump into it. Number one, this evening, I want you to see Nehemiah made a request for participation. I love this. This never gets old. Verse number five. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me. Send me. Now, Nehemiah is a slave. Not exactly a great set of circumstances. But he is also the king's cupbearer, which means that he dwells in the palace. Nehemiah's got a pretty good gig going on. He tastes the king's food. There was probably some steak that passed that way. I'm not complaining. If the king wants to put a 10-ounce sirloin in front of me, you know, it's it's a hard cross to bear, but, you know, God bless me. I'll pass the A1, all right? Amen. Nehemiah probably, as a king's advisor, would have been required to dress in such a manner, so clothing and and fine raiment would have been provided for him. We might even go as far to say that Nehemiah enjoyed a somewhat comfortable existence. And yet, Nehemiah does not ask that the king would send someone else. Nehemiah was not a prophet. 
He was, as we might say, Nehemiah was just a dude. <laughs> He's just a man. And yet he says, God send me. Now, folks, please don't misunderstand me this evening. I understand to whom I am speaking. This is a church who has a heart for missions. And I had no intention of coming here this evening to beat you over there with a rod of iron. But how often do we delegate the honor of the Great Commission to somebody else? The preacher will get up and say, we need to go out. We need to reach the lost for Christ. We go, yeah, somebody should do that. Let me know how that turns out for you. Nehemiah said, send me. And Nehemiah understood where he was about to be headed. Nehemiah was going to leave the palace for ruins. He was going to leave the fine meats and the fine wines for rations. He was going to leave the safety and security of being a servant in the king's palace for the dangers of building in Jerusalem. He was trading everything we would say in America was a good thing. It was good stuff. And he was going to trade all of that for the very things we often seek to stay away from. And he said, send me. What about you this evening? What role are you going to play in reaching Cleveland, Ohio for the cause of Christ? Your role. Not your pastor's role. Not the deacon's role. Your role. Your place. But Brother Gall, you don't understand. I'm, I'm nobody important and I just, you know, I just work a regular job. Can I help you understand this evening that your job was given to you as your mission field? God did not give you your job so you could make money. I'm glad that we get to. Amen. God gave you the job that he gave you because there are people there that need Jesus. And if you don't give him to them, no one will. I've heard preachers say so often, we're running out of time. Jesus is coming back. Can I tell you, my friends, we are out of time. We're out of time. And what we need now, and I understand it's a hard thing, it's a scary thing, but what we need now more than ever is God's people who are willing to leave the comfort and convenience that God has blessed you with and trade that for a hard life so that someone might have the chance to receive what you are given freely every week. When we were headed to Siberia, there was a... <laughs> There was a, a statistic we used to give. This is still true. There are 185 people groups, roughly, in the country of Russia. 118 of them are registered as unreached. We were going to work with a group of people called the Yanet peoples. Uh, there is only 212 of them left. That means is we could fit their entire race in this room. What you think about that? It's pretty crazy. They all live in one village. I could point it to you on the map. There is no history of the gospel in the history of their race. Nothing. They would, they, whether it came from, a, a, an, a, from orthodoxy or from one of the cults, nothing. They still slaughter reindeer and worship the ancestors. And they are going extinct. It's very possible this evening that before my life is done, their entire race will step into hell. And no one is trying to get to them. You know, in that same light, outside these walls, down the street, there's a guy, and he's at the end of his rope. And he doesn't know it yet, and maybe he doesn't even know enough to hope for it. But if somebody doesn't get to him, nobody will. Teenagers, there are, there are young people in your school that need you. 
Well, they, they may not like me. No, no, no. They need you. Their world is falling apart around them. They need Christ. And if you don't tell them, nobody will. Their mama and daddy won't. The grandparents won't. Their friends won't. Friends, so-called. And if you don't tell them, nobody will. Mom, dad, there are people at your place of business that need to hear from you of the hope that is within you. Why do we delegate that to somebody else? Nehemiah, he made a request for participation. Secondly, this evening I want you to see that he made a, a request for protection. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. I want to articulate this carefully. Do you work out your own Christianity in such a way that you require God's protection because the forces of evil are working to stop you? Can I, can I put it to you this way? Do the forces of hell, do they know your name? One of my favorite passages in Scripture, there's a group of men and they're trying to work to cast out a demon and they, they make the comment in the name of Paul and the demons say, we know who Paul is. Who are you? Does hell know your name? C.S. Lewis said that the greatest desire of my life is that when I die, all of hell rejoices that I am no longer in the fight. Are you a threat? Or when Satan and his forces look at your life, they go, ah, don't worry about them. He's too wrapped up in his football. She's too wrapped up in her job. Those teenagers, they're too wrapped up in their video games. They're too wrapped up in their boyfriend, girlfriend. You don't have to worry about them. They don't, they don't pose a threat. If Satan were to come before the, the throne of heaven, much like he did during the events of the book of Job, would God be able to say, as he did of that servant, have you beheld my servant, John Smith? We talk about protection and what we want, if we're being honest, we don't want protection, we want comfort. There's an idea within Christianity that if we're doing it right, <laughs> that we don't suffer persecution. And I'm sorry to break it to you folks, but that's not in the scripture. In fact, the exact opposite is. Jesus said, they hated me. If you serve me, they're going to hate you. We're in a time in history, folks, where God's people, we're going to have to start making some hard choices. We're going to have to start making some hard decisions. I remember when I sat across from my father-in-law for the first time and told him that I was taking his daughter to a closed country. That was not a pleasant conversation. <laughs> Why? I remember him saying to me, somebody else can go. And he's right. Somebody else could go, but God didn't ask somebody else. He asked me. And the truth of the matter is, when you say, well, somebody else can reach Cleveland, Ohio, but God didn't ask somebody else. He asked you. Nehemiah was not concerned with his own comfort and convenience. He was concerned with the work. God, protect this work so that for the cause of Christ we can move forward. You know, if we're not moving forward, we don't need God's protection. The church no longer feels the need to ask for God to divinely protect him because the church no longer moves forward with such vigor, with such enthusiasm, with such passion that she requires God's protection. I was talking with a preacher a few months ago when we were discussing 
the theoretical possibilities of what could be done in a country where religious proselytizing is free. So if everybody, why don't you, we're going we're to do a little math. I know it's not school. Forgive me. You can blame Brother Steve. Amen. I want you, we're going to do a little bit of math, okay? Let's say over the next year, a year from now, if every person in here under the sound of my voice, the next year you find one person, just one, and you lead that person to Christ, you bring them to church, they get baptized, and you disciple them. You disciple them. In 12 months, your church doubles. In 24 months, your church quadruples. Come on now. A man once did the math, and he said if every person led somebody to Christ, but they only led one person to Christ a year, but then the next year that person led somebody to Christ, and so on and so forth, that statistically the entire world could be reached in 36 years. What are we waiting for? Why would we be willing to sit content? <laughs> May I put it to you this way? I'm, I'm a young pup. I am. I haven't built so much as a popsicle stand. I get it. I'm a young kid. But I have gotten so weary of hearing people talk about what God did 20 years ago. I want to see it today. I'm grateful for the testimonies of a brother Jack Hiles, of a, of, of a, brother, of a C.T. Studd, of a Hudson Taylor, of an Adoniram Judson. I'm grateful, but they ran their race. They did. <laughs> I want to see it today. People talk about the Red Sea parting. Man, that's awesome. I'd love to see it. I don't want to hear about it. I want to see it. We talk about revival and God's working as if he don't do that anymore. He does. We hear about stories of, of the missionary that goes to the deep, dark jungles and God divinely protects him from the voodoo witch doctors. And we go, that's incredible. We can see that ourselves. Why don't we, Brother Gold? Because we are content to do nothing. The truth of the matter is, is that in so many churches, our Christianity is words. Just words. People say that COVID hurt the church. It didn't. It revealed her. I understand it was real. I understand that people died. And I'm not making light of any of that. But the plight that we see our church in today, people say, well, you know, the church has just really suffered over the last few years. No, 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 my friends. What we are seeing is God revealing the church for what she is. We have paid so little a price for so long that at the mere hint of pressure, we cave. Now, I say all of that Here's the beauty. We're not dead, so God's not done with us. My daddy, <laughs> nobody can quite say things the way your dad can, right? My daddy, he used to say to us kids, and this isn't the most grammatically articulate way to say it, but he used to say, David, if you're still sucking wind, God ain't done with you. I like that. I don't care if you're 16. I don't care if you're 160. God's not done with you. That's the beauty of it. What we were yesterday may not have been what we should be, but we can be it today. So let's be it today. Number three, and then my time with you this evening will be done. Nehemiah made a request for participation. He made a request for protection, but lastly this evening he made a request for provision. Look at verse number eight. The Bible says, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may Give me timber. Now, it's okay. This is not a gimmick for me to try and get in your pocketbooks. <laughs> that's, that's not what this is. I don't, I don't have any interest in that. I want you to think about something. Much like our desire for God's protection, 
do we choose to exercise a faith and step out in such a way that if God doesn't provide, it ain't going to happen? Do we do that? I'm not talking about your pocketbook, folks. This is not, I'm not trying to reel you in. <laughs> I'm talking about you. Your ministry. And you have one. Every one of you does. Young person, you have a ministry. I don't know if you knew that, but you do. You have a ministry. Some of you have a call of duty ministry. Oh, yeah. Some of you will sit in chat rooms. Some of you will sit in chat rooms tonight. You're going, come on, brother. Go, I need you to speed it up because I got, I, got, I got a game to play tonight. I need you to hurry this mess up. Some of you will sit in a chat room tonight with a teenager that would not ever give a guy like me the time of day. But he listened to you. Oh, yeah, he would. Oh, yeah, he would. Oh, yeah. How do you use that ministry? Some of you maybe are involved in activities outside of your work, outside of church, whether we call them hobbies, whatever you want to call them, the way we spend our time. When you go to the next time Ohio State smacks Michigan, amen? All right, all right. Just want to make sure you're with me, amen? I'm sorry, my brother. I had to slip it in there. When you're sitting with God's blessed Buckeyes, amen, maybe while we're there cheering them on, Hey, can I give you something? Now, here's the beauty. When we think historically of all that God has provided, I mean, when we, when we really sit down and, and mark it out, his, his provision is limitless. It has no limit. So instead of asking as little as possible, what if we went in the other extreme? I mean, let's just, let's dream big for a minute, shall we? Let's, this will be fun. It'll be fun. We're going to have some fun. It's okay to have fun in church. Brother Steve, how, would you, how many people would you say, roughly, ballpark, live in Cleveland, Ohio? Uh, one million. Okay. Awesome. One million. We're going to say one million because I like nice round numbers. So we're going to say a million. Okay. So let us literally, realistically, not, that's what the preacher said, Realistically, let's sit down and consider a goal that we're going to reach the city of Cleveland, Ohio in the next five years. Now hear me out. You say, Brother Gall, that's impossible. I know, that's what makes it so much fun. Million people, five years, okay? If that's our goal, how would you live your life differently to achieve that? Do that thing. Here's the beauty. Is for most of us, the places we go, the people we talk to, none of that has to change. Much like your preacher said this morning, what we talk to them about does. So if, if we, let's say there's 100 people, and let's say each of us reach somebody every year, so in, 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 in a year, 100 goes to 200, in another year, 200 goes to 400, in another year, 400 goes to 800, and so on and so forth. We could see Cleveland reached. Wouldn't that be incredible? Wouldn't it be awesome for 10 years from now, if God should tell you is coming, that your ch grandchildren uh, or your great-grandchildren would talk about there was a revival that took place that swept the nation. And it started, of all places, in Cleveland, Ohio. And there was this little church that just decided God, use us. And instead of being content with the, the minimum requirements, they decided we're going to prove our God. We're going to see just how big he is. And we're just going to keep stepping forward. I say, Brother Gall, that couldn't happen. Why? Who told you that? Generally, when we go to churches, and I'm, I'm just about done. Generally, when we go to churches, I get told one of two things. Either one, I get told, man, you crazy. How can we help? Or we get told, man, you crazy. <laughs> and you know what? I probably am. 
God, God can't reach. You're going to reach Russians. I mean, they get shot if they smile. I mean, come on. Like, you're telling me, Brother Gall, that God is going to do a mighty work among Slavic peoples? Oh, yes, he is, and I can't wait to see it. It's not an if. It's a when. I believe it with all my heart. And I want to play my part. But you know, if God had me stay right here in Cleveland, Ohio, and some of you are going, man, I sure hope God doesn't because that boy is crazy. But if God had me stay right here, then by golly, we're going to reach Cleveland because this is our home. This is our Jerusalem. Or we will be another check mark in history. A group, a group of people that Love Jesus, but not that much. They were excited for God, but not too excited. What will our story be? I think about this, and I promise I'm done. It's a promise every traveling preacher makes, right? Nehemiah was not the only person that had the information that Nehemiah had. In fact, if you go back to chapter 1, there was a host of men that came back from Jerusalem that gave the information to Nehemiah that led to the events of the book of Nehemiah. My question is this, where were all those guys? Nehemiah was not unique because he had the information. Nehemiah was unique because he did something. He did something about it. All of us know that our country, our world, is in a lot of trouble. But knowing is not enough. Something must be done. And we're the ones that get to do it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you folks have been so wonderfully patient. Listen to a young man scream and spit. I told you at the beginning of all of this that when I was done, I was going to ask each and every one of you to make a decision. Here's the decision. Nehemiah prayed to participate. He prayed for protection. He prayed for provision, and God gave him everything he asked for. My challenge to you this evening is would you pray that same prayer? Would you ask God tonight to send you? It might be for God to send you across the street. It might be for God to send you across the Atlantic. If you want to come to Siberia, we'll save you a hut. It'd be great. I'm not worried about the place. But would you ask God to send you? Hey, that's a scary prayer because God might say yes. <laughs> but would you pray that? Hey, young person, would you pray that? I'm not talking about you waiting until you're done with Bible college. Heaven help us. Would you ask God now to send you? God, send me to the lost. Would you ask God tonight as he sends you to protect the work he gives you to do? And with the promise of his presence and protection, would you move forward with boldness? Would you trust God tonight and ask him to provide? As by way of testimony, can I tell you tonight that my family has never done without? But there has been grace given and given and given again. I have been young and now I'm old and have not seen the righteous forsaken nor has seen begging bread. Would you pray the prayer Nehemiah prayed all those years ago that we might see another great work done for the cause of Christ. As the piano begins to play, the altar is open. Would you come and would you ask God to do these things in your life we call this an altar because it's the place where things come to die. We die to ourselves. We die to our own dreams, our own ambitions, our own desires, and we truly just give God all of ourselves. Now, folks, I get it. That can be a scary thing. It can be. Brother Gall, are you scared to go to Belarus every day of my life? But there's a God that can. Maybe you're here this evening and God has blessed your family. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Not a thing in the world. 
but maybe you're worried that if I give it all to God, I, I, I might lose everything he's given. Can I tell you this evening, like he said so many years ago, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall. That's a word of promise. Be added unto you. Maybe you're here this evening and there was a time in your life that you were in the middle of the fight. And years have passed now and perhaps you've gotten a little tired. You've served faithfully for so many years. And it's just hard, Brother Dalton. It's just hard to keep going. I encourage you this evening, let us... Let's get up again and finish our race. Let's fight our fight. Finish our course. Keep the faith. Keep on keeping on, however you want to say it this evening. Young person, I want to talk to young people right now, just you. Don't you dare believe the lie that you can't serve God because you're young. That is a lie. You can have the greatest impact amongst us all. But you got you to put it all on the altar. Just like Nehemiah did. And you can. Piano's still playing. There's still time. I don't want to rush a thing. The only tragedy that could occur tonight is that we would take a hard look at all that God could do. And we would say no. preaching to myself tonight I don't want to I don't want to be bound by my own fear I want to see the miracles but we got to get out of the palace to see the miracles the new year is coming very quickly what will Crossroads Baptist Church be in 2023 will that be the year that God moves in such a way And you faithful folks, you wonderful faithful folks, you get to see God do a work in your life, your life, not just the church's life, your life, that you've never seen before. Wouldn't that be a thing? As the piano plays one more verse of invitation, in your seats, as we're praying, maybe you're here tonight and Maybe you've been in church all your life, but if you were here to be honest, and you were to die right now, you would split hell wide open. You have church, you have religion, you do it all wonderfully, but you don't have Christ. I would encourage you tonight, before the evening is done, would you come to me? I would love to share with you the best news in the world. every head bowed and every eye closed we end in prayer I hope tonight that you will let God's word change us not my words, those don't matter God's words that would be something Heavenly Father I thank you for these wonderful faithful people Lord I'm so grateful for their consistency and their willingness to be here tonight on a rainy cold Sunday night, they could be anywhere. They chose to be here. Lord, I'm grateful for a church whose heartbeat is missions, who desires above all else to see your gospel given around the world. God, I pray that you work in our hearts here tonight. I pray that we would not just take the responsibility of the Great Commission corporately, but we would take it personally. Wouldn't it be the greatest blessing of blessings to see revival start right here, right in this city, to see our friends and family right here in this city reached with the gospel, and discipled, and see them reaching others? And, oh, that would be that would be something really special. 
We love you, Jesus. Thank you so very, very much for loving us. We ask these things in your name. And we ask and believe. Amen. Thanks, Lord. Let me ask you to stand. We are going to sing one, at least one stanza. Some have already come. Some have knelt at the altar and prayed. But uh, it's not too late to respond. Maybe you fought through that time. The Lord was working on your heart. And the Spirit was saying, you know, you need to go forward and, and either make that public or lay that before me and ask the Lord for help. So, Brother Sean, Sister Barb, lead us in one more stanza of this song. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. Amen. I, I hope you took notes tonight. These are some things that, uh, that Brother Gall said that will uh, challenge you if you think about them. Maybe as you're driving home tonight, maybe in your devotional time, tomorrow morning as you wake up, what role are you going to play in reaching our community with the gospel? Am I willing to leave the palace? Am I willing to leave the comforts of where I'm at for a hard life? You know, that's the decision that we're called to make. That uh, Brother Gall challenged us with. And whether you realize it or not, you have made a decision. Whether it's the right one or the wrong one. It's never too late at this point to change that. I love this. Does hell know your name? <laughs> Are you a threat to the enemy? Are you content with just doing nothing? Is your Christianity just words? Well, those are convicting thoughts. Are you living by faith in such a way that if God doesn't step in and do it, then it just won't happen? Happen. What are you going to do with what you've heard tonight? Again, many have made decisions. They've come to the altar. Maybe you've prayed right there in your pew. Uh, let these thoughts and the Spirit of God work in your heart and life and just simply say yes, Lord, to whatever he asks you to do. Well, a few announcements as we wrap things up. Let me get to my announcement page here. Um, First off, Rainbow Fellowship is uh, this Thursday, 11 a.m. at Canaries here in North Olmstead. If you're planning on going, let Brother Jim know just so the uh, make sure that uh, he has the count close to being correct for the, uh, the uh, restaurant there. It's always a great time of fellowship. Uh, play, pray for Pastor Bill, Sister Shannon as they travel uh, the uh, rainy, rainy, wet roads down to Tennessee and back. Uh, continue to uh, pray for uh, Ben Thompson's recovery from surgery. Charlie Haney's healing. It was so good seeing him this morning. Ron Robles, cataract surgery sometime this coming Wednesday. Um, and I failed to mention this uh, this morning, but there is a church business meeting that's been announced already. But our annual church business meeting is Sunday evening, December 11th. We'll present the 2023 budget to the church and ultimately vote on that for approval. The ladies' Christmas party, I, I do have the sign-up sheet in my email, so it'll go up tomorrow morning. And uh, so Wednesday when you come here, ladies, if you're planning on participating in that on the 16th of, of December, uh, make sure you get signed up and uh, find the direction that you need for what, what I'm sure will be another great time of fellowship with our ladies' ministry. All right, 
Anything else that I missed? Anyone else have an announcement that I failed to mention? Jim. Uh, Tina Toller? Dillinger. Wow. Okay. Pray for Tina Dillinger. Some habits die hard. That was her old <laughs> name from many years ago. That's how long I've been around, I guess. Um, pray for her. She fell in the, in the uh, hallway out there and hurt her ankle. Still waiting to find out how bad that is. Frank. So pray for Frank Scully, tumor in his liver that they do believe is cancerous. Pray for uh, the biggest need he has is to know the Lord as his Savior. And, uh, and pray for each other. Um, I know what many of you do, and I know many of you are in the battle on a daily basis. And the devil and all hell knows your name, and you feel it on a daily basis as you try to to minister the gospel in your places of work and your neighborhoods and so forth. So keep at it and pray for each other, encourage each other, and be motivated by what you see your brothers and sisters in Christ and our church doing. And you can do the same, to open your mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, and the Lord will be with you to do that. Amen? Well, I invite you to stand. Brother Goff, you can head out to your table. Make sure you stop by, uh, visit with him on your way out, get a prayer card, and pray for his family, his wife, the, the baby that will soon be arriving the details of of getting to the place that god has called them to that still need to to fall into place and um when you're going to a, a difficult place to access there's going to be a lot of hurdles and uh, red tape and bureaucracy to go through but uh if god's called you he'll get you there and he'll bring you there at the appointed time amen all right seth harbaugh would you lead us in our closing prayer and then sean will come and lead us in our closing song Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Good night. Thank you.